but before we can get to the Rhino Milk frenzy, just a few more setups occur. We talked a bit about Carly wanting to kill Captain America in the Flag Smasher video. Just wanted to add a little bit more context to this problem. See, when Carly says things like, That shield is a monument to a bygone era. A reminder of all the people history just left out. If anything, that shield should be destroyed. And I know a way that we can deal with Sam without getting involved in a direct fight. Yeah. How do you propose we do that? We separate them. And then we kill Captain America. I get reminded of these. separate them and then we kill Captain America. You liar! If you have a deep-rooted hatred for that shield or whatever the fuck reason you've got, down to the point that you have a desire to kill the new Captain America, I don't know what to tell you other than we can do better. We also talked about Sam sending the dark web message to Sharon to keep an eye on John in her video. At this point, it's just kind of funny that she brought this up to keep an eye on the Flag Smashers in case Zemo betrayed them, but we're not doing that. Bucky calls John crazy. Something's not right about Walker. I know crazy when I see one, because I am crazy. I'm going to try my best to describe this next section as less schizophrenic as the scene was. After Bucky gets into the safe house, John and Lamar get inside shortly after. Then shortly after this, the Dora Milaje gets into the safe house. Bucky, you were the one who said this. Well, the Wakandas are here. They want Zemo. Bought us some more time. Were you followed? No. How can you be so sure? Because I know when I'm being followed. So you didn't know that John and Lamar and the Dora fucking Malaja were following you? Who's the crazy one now? More on the Dora in a bit. Given that John and Lamar get into Zemo's safe house after Sam, Zemo, and Bucky, leads me to believe that they left John and Lamar behind at the Flag Smasher establishment. How the fuck were Sam and Bucky able to carry an unconscious Zemo back to his safe house without John and Lamar interfering? John is the one who insisted on not having Zemo get away. You can start by telling us why you broke him out of prison. He did that himself, technically. Oh, this better be an unbelievable explanation. Take it. We'll deal with you later. I'm sure it will all come to an agreeable conclusion. Uh, hey, you got 10 minutes. Really? And we're doing things my way. Aggressive. But I get it. Do you expect me to believe that this man would allow two Avengers that broke him out to take him to another location without any resistance? The first trap vibes are oozing onto my screen. Wonderful. 150 million dollars and we're struggling at a writing and learning comprehension level to the fucking writers for five minutes could you not be yourself for five minutes still no dora hold on john and lamar get inside zemo's safe house now there's two possibilities as to how this occurred given that bucky went inside just recently they must have followed bucky as we've seen plenty of examples People can follow Bucky, and he'll only notice when the plot wants him to. And the second one is a bit of a headcanon given that the Dora Milaje were able to know where the group was going to be at the right time and date, where Io dropped her super valuable vibranium balls on the ground, and hoped Bucky would find them, pick them up, and give them back to her. Point is, if Wakanda is able to find Zemo before he even decides to step foot in that country, mind you, I'm pretty sure John Lamar would have done so as well. Since we know that John and Lamar knew about the group's location thanks to the internet, they should have ways to cross-reference Zemo and Latvia. 
so as long as the government was competent enough to check through Zima's connections. I can't say it's too far from the possibility, however, I am much more comfortable saying Bucky is a hypocrite for not being able to notice his surroundings until the plot says so. Now for the dialogue. Once again, John is ready to arrest Zemo like he's supposed to, but as usual, Sam be dum dum. And let's be clear, shield or no shield, the only thing you're running in here is your mouth. Wait, what? Shield or no shield. What the fuck did the shield have to do with what John said about turning Zemo over? I'm not sure if it was meant to be one of those slip outs where you accidentally say something you're feeling frustrated about, but you didn't mean to say it. That doesn't seem like the case given that Sam said it so casually. Also, running his mouth. Oh, I'm sure you know all about that. Now I had Carly. You really didn't. No matter what the writers say. And you overstepped. No, he didn't. Bucky was the one who let him go. With no resistance, mind you. So fuck you. He's actually proven himself useful today. Almost useful. He could have killed Carly. And we're gonna need all hands on deck for whatever's coming next. This should have been the case in episode two, you jackass. Now the next part is another one of those Force Walker cringe moments. How do you want the rest of this conversation to go, Sam? Huh? Should I put down the shield? Make it fair? Don't talk like one of them. You're not. Even if you'd like to be. All I can really say for John, and possibly Lamar, is to say that it was Bucky that allowed them to go up early. But I think we've held this part long enough. And here we go. Just when I thought they couldn't get any stupider. Good luck trying to convince me that this was not an attempt to kill Captain America on foreign soils. Headlines of a Wakandan killing an American in Latvia while he was trying to return the criminal Zemo back to his cell in Berlin, Germany. Fucking hell. I can comment on how it was super lucky that John looked up just in time and he was quick enough to dodge the vibranium spear that was hurling towards his face, but I'm not going to do this now. What the actual fuck was the plan? Given that you are the only ones who came from inside the house, I'd have to assume you must have sneaked your way into the place without the group hearing you. Maybe she's wearing Shuri's sneakers, I guess. But what actually prompts you to javelin throw a vibranium spear to a defenseless man? Intimidation? How could he be intimidated if you were successful? John's reaction to the spear in the wall is priceless, props to Wyatt, but holy fuck, this could have been an unmitigated geopolitical disaster. Thank you to Awkward Game Developer for the visual. The more I try to reason with it, the worse it gets. I can't breathe. More of the Dora come in. Way to go, Bucky, for not being able to notice more people before you came in. I have to wonder if the other Doras wanted John dead before they arrived to get Zemo, because killing John would have allowed the Dora to bring Zemo to prison. Do they just want all the credit? My work is done here. What do you mean your work is done? You didn't do anything. You do realize that Walker is trying to send Zemo to prison too, right? Is his decision to bring Zemo back to Berlin, where he was before, that bad for you guys wanting Zemo at the raft instead? To the point where you had to kill him? By the way, aren't you people ignoring your king's wishes? He was the one who sent him to Berlin with Bilbo Ross at the end of Civil War. I hope these questions are providing the flimsy foundations as to why some sort of fight is about to happen. Before we get there, the scene tries to act like John is being unreasonable and crazy in the scene. Hi, John Walker. Captain America. Well, let's, uh... Let's put down the pointy sticks, and we can talk this through. As usual, there are two ways to interpret this moment. I think it's pretty cool that John, even after they tried to take his head off, he's still willing to have a civil conversation with the Wakandans to come to an understanding. When John called the Dormalaji spear pointy sticks, or whatever, it was so microaggressive. Oh no, he called a spear a pointy stick which is what they are. Also, microaggression? Seriously? Whose fault is that to be offended by a statement that's just factually true? And another thing, Sam looks way too excited that John is about to get his ass kicked. Tone the fuck down, you psycho. John, take it easy. He's pretty calm. In fact, it's pretty unreal how based he is after almost getting his head taken out. Even if he was jittery, would John not be justified if he didn't take it easy after almost being killed? Hmm, Sam? You've got to do better. You might want to fight Bucky before you tangle with the Dora Milaje. No, he wouldn't. And besides, why is fight the first thing you said? John literally offered to talk about this like a diplomat. What would be the reason to fight the Dora Milaje outside of John almost being killed by them? Sometimes it's difficult to remember that everyone in this room is an adult. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction here. Technically, John, nobody in this room has jurisdiction. You and Lamar could have had it, 
but it was your choice to not take it. But let's get to the line. Dora Milaje have jurisdiction wherever the Dora Milaje find themselves to be. This is a super villain line. I don't care what else needs to be said about this. It's honestly bizarre that this isn't the worst line in the show, but boy, it's up there. I'm not going to mention Civil War. That's just beating a dead horse at this point. May I remind you that the Sokovia Accords have been repealed. Let's use the show's own logic. The show tries to shed a not-so-good light on imperialism. It's a simple question. Is it not good that the government is taking things that aren't theirs to give away to others? So, when you literally have someone bringing up that jurisdiction doesn't matter, it would seem like the show would say that these people are the bad guys, because it completely goes against what the show is saying. But no. Apparently, the official Marvel Studios Twitter account says, As they should. <laughs> we don't even need to use the real world in this context. In your own movies and the show, you talked about these things being bad. No, 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 no. Who the fuck cares that your own king, the late great King T'Chaka, was the one who advocated these accords that were meant to stop people like you from doing this kind of bullshit. Is there some sort of mutiny in Wakanda that we don't know about? Two examples of going against two different kings' wishes in the same episode. I guess we'll have to wait till Black Panther Wakanda forever to understand what the fuck is going on. Spoilers. They do not. But it turns out John has committed an act of treason, an unspeakable act of no-no proportions. A trigger warning has been advised. I think we got off on the wrong foot. <laughs> So the writers got to their mandate of forcing a fight scene. It's because John touched Io's shoulder. Instead of just brushing the arm off of her and actually allowing John to talk to them civilly like he wanted to, she takes her vibranium spear to his shoulder, hit it to his leg and face, which gets him a bit dazed, then kicks him so hard into the vibranium spear in the pillar by the back that you would think Io was a super soldier. We'll come back to that. But let's get to another insane part. <laughs> If John did not pick up that shield, the Wakandan would have stabbed him through the heart, because he committed the sin of touching Io's shoulder, and the writers want me to side with them? Well, look at what they have the title heroes of the show do. We should do something. Looking strong, John! But look, it's okay, because Sam tells Bucky that he really should do something as Io is literally about to stab John. John even has a moment to look into Io's eyes, but she still pulls her arm back for the kill. That's when Bucky stops her. Fuck you, cucky. The attitude of these two heroes is just too much. Two grown adults that heard this conversation by other adults, and this is the attitude you have? John can easily die. Lamar can easily die. But no, they just don't give a fuck. We've moved beyond character assassination. This is just who they are now. I'd like to say something about the- Go fuck yourself. Io then starts to fight Bucky, because I guess she really wanted to kill John, and she's upset that she isn't allowed to now. What a bizarre way the writers wanted us to like these characters. Moving on. The Dora Milaje always do these weird spinning tricks around their necks for some reason. I guess to look cool. But given how adamant all of you are to kill John Walker for no logical reason, it really is just delaying the inevitable because the plot doesn't actually want you to kill John. Meanwhile, two Wakandans are fighting Lamar. For what reason? He didn't do anything. Please don't say it was because he's John's friend. I beg you. In fact, both John and Lamar have a moment where a Wakandan cocks their arm back, about to stab each of them before Sam and Bucky save them. Fucking hell. Lamar was writhing in pain before the Wakandan tried to stab him. Truly despicable. If each of you had the attempt to kill John and Lamar, what's the point of all the twirling you did as if you didn't want to kill them? At least there's something I can like about this scene, and that's just Zemo taking a sip of his drink. As if to think that all of these people are fighting for where he will go to prison. And probably the biggest brain move of the series. That's my exit cue. In an attempt to see who will get control of Zemo, he runs away without anyone noticing. It's ironic. I'm just going to give John and Lamar an unofficial pass for this. There's already too much shit going on. Like this next part here. John has a considerable amount of distance from the table behind him. In this shot, the Wakandan is standing in the corner where the first Wakandan threw the spear at John that hit the pillar. That would be behind the table, so behind John. But in the next shot, the Wakandan is in the corner where John is actually looking at 
where the doors of the safe house is. Ignoring that editing teleportation, she successfully threads the needle and locks John's shield into the table, which is much closer now compared to before. In fact, she threads it so perfectly that John's arm is still in the bands, stuck in the table, and completely unharmed. Well, now that John is incapacitated, you can kill him now, right? Because that's all he wanted to do. Because he wanted to put Zemo in jail that your king put him in. Because he committed the sin of touching Io's shoulder. We've talked about Io removing Bucky's arm in his dedicated video. It was pretty funny how the official Disney Plus subtitles translated the moment as Speaking Wakandan James instead of Bust Damn You James. But seriously, damning Bucky for stopping you from killing John at the last second? I can totally see why the writers wanted us to like these characters. Speaking of likable characters, John gets his arm out of the shield. Before John tries to pull it out for himself, the Wakandan lady pulls it out just fine. The government did a study of your body at MIT and you tested off the charts in every measurable category. Speed, endurance, intelligence. I'm sure John would have been able to pull the spear out on his own after struggling to get his arm out, but this shot was necessary. Soka. The next bit of dialogue is a bit strange. He is gone. Leave it. This sort of implies that if Zemo was still in the room, the Wakandans would have taken the shield? But what sense does that make? If the point is that the shield is vibranium, therefore it belongs to Wakanda, well then, is the show prepared to ask the question if a nation could own an entire commodity? Stop it. Get some help. Zemo is gone, and everyone in this room is an idiot for fighting about him and his control. The Dora Milaje leave, so there was nothing achieved in the scene except for this line from John. They weren't even super soldier. In your defense, John. <laughs> are we certain that they're not enhanced? In all seriousness, I just feel bad for John. And in a meta sense, it's like he's upset with the writers for making this all stupid around him. He's written to be the best of the best. The government did a study of your body at MIT and you tested off the charts in every measurable category. Speed, endurance, intelligence. But he can't actually be that because plot. Expect disappointment and you will never get disappointed. Good for Lamar to help his friend after he's clearly upset. I showed this shot in my trailer for the video. Sam's face is absolutely despicable. Acting like this was all John's fault for everything that happened. It's not an understatement as to how much I hate Sam in the show, but we'll save that conversation for the next video. We get some pretty good character work from Lamar and John after the kerfuffle with the Dora. We get some fans asking for an autograph, some banter about how Lamar would sign his name with a little Battlestar logo. That's nice. John asks Lamar what his opinions are if he wanted to take the Super Soldier Serum or not. I think Lamar puts up an interesting perspective in this discussion. Power just makes a person more of themselves, right? Carly Morgenthau, Steve Rogers. I think when people use the lines from Dr. Erskine in The First Avenger, The men. The serum amplifies everything that is inside, so good becomes great, bad becomes worse. I believe people take what he said a bit too literally. Also, Steve's serum and John's serum are completely different. Who's to say what Erskine said is applicable to each different type of serums that we've seen so far? Not to mention, the serum that Red Skull used was defective in the first place. Anyways, there seems to be this sort of notion that power can corrupt, but Lamar's theory gives an idea that the serum can make more of what possible corruption was there to begin with. With the serum, you have more abilities to make more choices, so these are the things that makes up the person and their experience with the serum differently. I think the next part with John is interesting as well. In me, you already have three medals of honor. You consistently make the right decisions in the heat of battle. What makes this part interesting is how his viewpoints about his three medals of honor are brought to the forefront. Yep. Three badges of excellence to make sure I never forget the worst day of my life. On the one hand, I like how John's demeanor isn't really changed from episode 2 with regards to the three medals of honor. He questioned his legitimacy of being the new Captain America, and we get more of this perspective of why it was giving him doubts on whether he deserved the role or not, which he does. And I do like that John views him being Cap as a way to put himself back on the right track, and how Lamar wished that 
if they had the serum that day in Afghanistan so that they could have saved more lives. It's also pretty neat that John says, we were rewarded for those medals of honors, which is an all-time bro comment. On the other hand, this sort of stuff does come out of nowhere, which I want to make this part clear. I'm not an idiot show. Putting these characters in casual clothes, making things seem more personal, talking about how they're the best of friends. We're like the dynamic duo, bro. We're like Batman and Robin. Someone is going to die. And all I can really say to the both of you is, Run, bitch! Run! We talked about how Sharon was keeping track of John when he was moving in on the Flag Smashers and how absurd that was multiple times. Now we can talk about this from John's perspective. We're not really told how it was that they found this area, so shut up about it. It's pretty strange that John and Lamar were separated from Sam and Bucky, again. With how dangerous these Flag Smashers are, you'd think they'd have understood the dangers of going at them separately. We can't learn this lesson until something happens to one of them, which we're almost there. John and Lamar approach this new warehouse, and they both have their guns ready. I hope they finally get to use those guns at some point. We still have the same bullshit from before with this off the books thing, and going into this hostile environment without any backup. Moving past this, something really weird happens. John is at the base of the staircase, while Lamar is going up the stairs. Not even a few seconds go by, after Lamar is out of frame, and John is in a bit of a panic. Now, given that there are two of you, you'd think staying back to back would be the best method in this situation. But just from a visual perspective, Lamar. Lamar. not enough time has passed for the situation, but it turns out they kidnap Lamar in two seconds. Not only that, they somehow managed to take Lamar without making any noise or some sort of commotion or any indication of some sort of struggle. It's truly bizarre how we go from one scene to the next and there are loads of problems. Like the fact that Lamar's gun is on the ground now, which is meant to indicate to John that Lamar was taken. But seriously? Neither the Flag Smashers nor John pick up this very valuable weapon from the ground? I guess we should shut up about these things. Got it? Yeah, As we see John head in the direction to find Lamar, we cut to Lamar being dragged into some bathroom by the Flag Smashers. Then this happens. What'd you bring me? This show really doesn't give a fuck about Lamar. Such a shame. I suppose I could mention how Lamar getting punched in the head like that would kill him, but I assume you know the drill by now. This gets the Flag Smashers to tie him up with zip ties. Then we cut back to John. There's a shot in here that's a bit funny, with John standing in front of a mirror that's all scratched up. I'd like to imagine that the director was like, He sees himself full of scratches. His image isn't clear to himself anymore. He's starting to lose himself in a rage. All thanks to the serum. Truly inspiring, Perry. John heads into a new room. We've talked about some pretty bad editing in this show, but this scene probably takes the cake in this regard. Everything happens pretty quickly, so I'll try to slow it down for my dear viewers to grasp my point. As John is going through this room, he's looking around from all angles, checking to make sure that there are no flag smashers around. He isn't doing this with a gun in his hand, but we've gotten used to this at this point. Upon getting past the last pillar, John experiences yet another sharp object that flies past his head and hits the pillar he's next to for the second time in the same episode. Absolutely lucky for John that this flag smasher had a knife instead of a gun, and that this guy with enhanced senses, thanks to the serum, had pretty bad aim to miss John who wasn't looking. Or was he really not looking? If you take a look at the slow motion, John takes a look around the area of the pillar. In that look around, he sees the area in which the direction where the knife will come from. So no show, you don't get to pull the teleporting flag smasher on me. Speaking of which, John continues to fight this flag smasher until he backs up into a wall. This causes him to super throw his shield into the wall. I know they wanted the surprise that this proves John has taken the serum, but what I'm surprised with is, what the hell happened to the scene? If you missed it, I don't blame you, but luckily, I got you. Let's see the moment in real time. Now, let's see the scene in slow motion. Notice how the room just changed in orientation? Also, notice that the guy that John was fighting, and the reason why he threw the shield in the first place, is just gone. Without a trace. Walker is honestly one of the most self-aware characters I've ever seen. 
He's frantically looking around for the flag smasher that he threw the shield at, who just disappeared out of the edit. What makes this even worse is this. Take a look at John's suit in the moment. Look at where his star is placed in this moment. Over his left shoulder, in the shot before, and every single John Walker moment in the suit, the star was over the right shoulder. If I had a dollar for every brain you don't have, I'd have one dollar. So, not only did they reshot the scene, and did not stitch it properly, they also put Wyatt in a completely new suit that had the star in the wrong place. How embarrassing. Credit to Brendan Wolf for spotting this mistake to me. I really appreciate it, dude. And to end this editing disaster, as Walker takes the shield out of the wall, the Flag Smasher just randomly appears from the corner of the room, even though John looked in that area where the guy came from, so we're just repeating the same problem from before. But hey, at least there's consistency. So who cares? You know what? That's a really great segue for Sam in the next scene. We see Sam arrive at the building that John and Lamar were at. Sam is just neutral at this moment. Oh shit. With all these hostile characters in the area, Carly rammed Bucky into a wall. Sam can't be bothered to do anything. I'm not sure what the writers want with Sam. I suppose he's not happy about John having the serum, but why? Now doesn't seem to be the time, especially when the seven terrorists that are in the building and Lamar is currently a hostage at the moment. Also letting the guy go so that he can lead you somewhere is probably a trap. Absolutely worthless, but that's for another day. I was wondering about this moment though. Oh shit. I'm wondering if the Australian Flag Smash's reaction to this feat John did is much stronger than all of his friends with the serum. Why do I think this? Well, consider what Dr. Nagel said in the last episode. But mine was going to be different. No clunky machines or jacked up bodies. Mine was going to be subtle, optimized, perfect. Consider that Carly and her Flag Smasher buddies were just regular people before they ingested the serum. Now consider what would happen if John, a military man that tested off the charts in strength and endurance without the serum, now has the serum. Seems like the ratio of John getting the serum would be much stronger if we use the logic of Carly being as small as she is with her strength level. Just something to think about. It's a good thing that the Flag Smashers were kind enough to leave Lamar's knife on his body so that he can escape later in the scene. They take his gun off his personage, but they leave it in the hallway. So are they really smart enough to take the knife off of him? Lamar's free now. That's cool. And now for the final fight of episode 4. A lot of this is about the same as the scenes before. It's lucky that the two Flag Smashers that were above John and Sam decided to land right behind so that the other two can turn around and be prepared to fight them. It's also lucky that they didn't have guns and just shot them from the high ground. We get a line that's meant to be one of those MCU memes. What's with all the knives? You've got a gun, Walker. Just saying. I do appreciate that Lamar gives winces of pain in the face after he got out of his bonds. That was neat. Even though that hit to the face should have killed him. But I do appreciate the little things here. We talked about John getting his arms locked by Jake so that Carly can go and stab him in the heart. Lamar is a massive chad for tackling Carly out of the way to save John's life. But unfortunately, the writer's hatred for Lamar has peaked. Tackling their queen, Carly, was the final straw. So she kills him by punching him hard into the pillar. Everybody stops in this scene, including the Flag Smashers for some reason. I just question after Carly burned innocent people, her want and desire to kill Captain America, and all this fighting with two Avengers and two government agents that killing Lamar was too far. I talked about how Carly would still probably kill John when he was checking to see if Lamar was alive or not. But what makes this even odder is that the Flag Smashers just stop and watch John check on Lamar. They wait for nearly 30 seconds until they decide to run away. With all the times they could have pulled out knives and getting into fights with these people, even down to planning on having the intent to kill people on multiple occasions, you think that this doesn't seem to be a big deal to them. I can't give them sympathy for waiting for so long when we know how Carly really feels about killing Lamar in episode 6. I didn't mean to kill your friend. I don't want to hurt people that don't matter. You don't think Lamar's life mattered? Not to my fight. And the other Flag Smashers are not characters, so there's the other problem. The Flag Smashers run away after some time. Sam and Bucky run out as well. 
which we'll get to in a bit, leaving John alone with Lamar. John sees the two running off, presumably after Carly, which gets him to jump out of the window in pursuit. They cut back to Lamar, which I thought they did this because maybe he didn't die, and what John is about to do is under the presumption that Lamar died, and how this might change the results of the next couple of episodes, but no. They just wanted to remind us that Lamar died, and this is why John is mad. Thank you, show. We know you didn't give a fuck about this, Chad. Rest in peace, Lamar, Battlestar, Hoskins. John finds the flag smasher that held him in the armbar lock so that Carly would kill him. Remember that. He throws a concrete water fountain into John, which means he's still an active threat. And then, we get the moment of truth, where all the shit hits the fan. Let me be very clear here. My problem isn't the fact that this is a scene in the show. On a narrative perspective, outside of Sam, Bucky, and Carly teleporting into the scene, but that's besides the point. My main issue is how camera shots, the ominous music, and reactions by the audience in the shot who have zero context as to what's going on, which is understandable. But all of these elements are meant to trick you into believing that this moment was an evil act, or maybe some sort of proof that John is the villain. This particular scene is the reason why I wanted to introduce the tweets into this section of the breakdown. I think it clearly brings up the multiple themes that people take from this moment, and how we get over the borderline of ridiculousness of where people take this. We can bring up a good one as an appetizer before we talk about the main course. People really misinterpreted the John Walker scene when it's super simple to understand. He watched his friend die while having the effects of the super serum, while having the pressure from set expectations of being Captain America. He snapped, like anybody else would. Well said. You would think this was super simple to understand. As you can see with some of these tweets, it appears that the consensus of the other sides can be summarized as John killing someone is a bad thing, how John has soiled the symbol that is the shield and what it represents, and that the man that John Walker killed was an innocent man. Let's get the last thing out of the way right now. And I know a way that we can deal with Sam without getting involved in a direct fight. Yeah. How do you propose we do that? We separate them. And then we kill Captain America. Nothing screams innocent about Jake here. It was his choice to be a part of these scenes and commit to the actions that he has done prior to his death. There's not really a form of surrender at this moment other than the standard, no, wait. But considering that this is an active situation, these sort of decisions are too quick in order to make the right kind of call, especially when the tables can be turned just as quickly if Jake had the high ground over John. We can use an example from Steve himself in the opening fight of Civil War. In the room that's all gassed up, after Cap is able to hit a soldier with his shield, the guy is so dazed to the point where he drops his gun and makes one of those Mortal Kombat finish them animations. You could argue that this would technically be some sort of surrender. Steve didn't have to smash kick him into the table afterwards, highly likely to have killed him. But given that this is an active situation, and that guy might have been able to get undazed and be an active threat again, gives Steve his right to neutralize the threat. Now let's continue to eviscerate Jake's monkey ass, because he pisses me off just as much as Mr. I joined the terrorist group because the GRC didn't give me teachers clown. Jake gets something like the defenseless take. John is not dealing with a defenseless man in the scene. Jake is a super soldier. He is the weapon. You have seen how Steve and Bucky deal with getting out of situations when they are restrained. You expect me to believe that John's foot on his chest is the Wallahi, I'm finished. Fuck no. You can get out of that shit easily. Then when it comes to being on the brink of death, does he try to appeal to Walker's humanity? No. He says... It wasn't me! It wasn't me! It's a fucking despicable line. You and the other Flag Smashers had this operation for the sole purpose of assassinating John Walker. Not to defeat him. Not to capture him. 
to kill him, and you would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for that meddling battle star. As if that was the only reason for John to be upset at him just because Lamar died? Or how about the fact that using this line is to justify his actions by saying that he should be killing Carly instead, his leader and supposed friend? I can even defend Carly for a second, as she did have a moment of doubt in the graveyard after learning about the orphan kids due to killing those GRC members. One of the workers killed was the father of two, and had only been on the job for one week. Do you think I'm making a mistake? Making more of us. But it was in fact you were the one who pushed her to continue on this path. And back then, there was just good and bad. But the world's more complicated now. People are lost. They need a leader who looks like them. Who understands their pain. Someone who understands that today's heroes don't have the luxury of keeping their hands clean. What we're doing will outlive the legacy of that shield. You enabled Carly, but now that your life is in danger, you throw her under the bus after holding John down? You couldn't even get yourself out physically, even with the serum, and you're a fucking coward. Also, you're a Cap fan, but you think all of his good came from a luxury? Just a false equivalence to you and your cause, and exposes more of that line just being there for the sake of a dramatic irony to occur, because Steve's life wasn't filled with luxury. We'll get more in detail where Walker was also wrong for the situation as well in a bit, but don't defend this fucking shit stain. Jake is not innocent, and Walker is not killing an innocent man in the scene. Let's cut the cap. Now let's tackle the real meat and potatoes of what this scene is trying to indicate with the sound and visuals that this is an evil act. Before we get to the man that is the reason why this narrative is happening in the first place, why don't we start off with Iron Man this time? When Iron Man is killing a bunch of terrorists in the scene, the music is all badass and framed in a heroic way. That's not to say that this scene is a problem, outside of the political aspect of an American vigilante acting on foreign soil, but not too far off compared to what Walker did. If the notion is still that Captain America is held to a higher standard, then I think it's time for a montage. Put the stones back, I thought. Maybe I'll try some of that life Tony was telling me to get. Steve has killed a lot of people. Steve has used a gun before. There are loads of times where that shield should have blood on it, like the way John got it in the scene. Don't just let a filmmaker trick you into believing that what John has done cannot be matched or even surpassed by someone else that is considered to be a hero. Nothing Walker does is compared to the Triskelion incident in Winter Soldier, where putting down the helicarriers was not only insane from a technological and strategic sense, but also the lack of awareness that this level of destruction could kill civilians civilians but also the people that Steve inspired to help him during this fight against Hydra. Remember, Sam almost died because of this action. That doesn't seem like a pleasant thing to experience. Don't take this the wrong way and assume the problem is Steve killing. That's not the problem when Steve is killing bad guys. 
I take more of an issue when poor decision making is a contributing factor when innocent lives are also being taken, but that's a different conversation. John has no reason to be treated any differently when considering all of these elements we have talked about. John Walker executed an incredibly powerful terrorist as he entered a public plaza after that same man helped kill his best friend and fellow soldier while aiming to kill John, attempting it once again seconds prior to the end of the fight. Natasha Romanov deliberately used an innocent child as bait for an assassination. In the attempt to get her target, she accepted, if not pushed for the child to be sacrificed, and she was unsuccessful. Drakov survived without a scratch. She would then go on to sign off on burying hundreds of people in an icy grave to break out what she could only know is a convicted drakov allied monster without a second thought while aligning herself with a wretched scumfuck on top of that. MCU fans are often sickened by John Walker's existence, while falling in love with just about everything Natasha does. These same people don't even notice that one of the most foul good guy characters from the MCU is walking free right now enjoying the fact that she escaped justice completely. It's become apparent that you fuckers need some simple, grounded stories to illustrate the very important difference between heroes and villains. This is because you can't handle any kind of individual thought about the actions of a character because you base the analysis almost exclusively on whatever the soundtrack played and what the camera zoomed into. And as for the writers, well, seriously. Do better. I think the weirdest argument I've heard about Walker in the situation is how he soiled the meaning of the shield. I promise this section is a lot sillier when we shift to the Sam perspective of the breakdown, but I find an explanation like this hilarious. He killed him with a shield, something meant to protect. Not using a weapon, using the symbol of protection for violence. Must be your first time watching an MCU product or something because anyone would know that S.H.I.E.L.D. has been used for protection and combat. I wonder where decapitation falls in this category. If soiled is meant to be referenced to the blood on the shield, there's been countless examples of moments where blood was on that shield. Should have been in the physical sense, but it is still applicable in the metaphorical sense. Good. Now that we've got all the bullshit narratives out of the way, I think we should make something clear. Was this the best decision to do? No. Is this a plausible option based on events that happen? Sure. The best option would have been to arrest Jake and take him to interrogation, but... Given that this is the heat of the battle, it's not unreasonable for this type of thing to happen. It's also difficult for Walker to really arrest the super soldier on his own, given that the other Flag Smashers have scattered, and he'd have no way of knowing where they were and if they would surprise him during the attempted arrest. Not to mention Clown Boy and Bozo aren't around to help him. There are other factors to consider in this hypothetical, of course. Also, will people be able to condemn him for these actions? Not many but it depends on how they choose to handle it in the next episode, which we're almost there. Now we can address Sam and Buggy. Rather than staying with John after he's looking at the corpse of his best friend, they decide to leave him in pursuit of the Flag Smashers. It's awfully convenient that they don't try to deal with John, who would understandably be upset and might do something he might regret down the line. They would probably go down that window if they saw Walker go out like that, because I would believe they wouldn't want John to do what he was going to do. And we know this isn't what they wanted him to do when we get to the opening of episode 5 soon. My perspective would change if Sam and Bucky at least caught a flag smasher or two that are ready to be arrested, and they just happened to be upon John killing a flag smasher, which would still be contrived as fuck, but at least they would have some sort of justification as to not being there to stop John from doing something he might regret. The fact that they did arrive empty-handed pretty much shows that the writers didn't know what Sam and Bucky would do in this scene because they probably would have stopped John, but they really want John to kill someone. So... They just had the right that they ran after Carly. It's unfortunate how they didn't catch her or anyone else to at least justify this decision, which is even odder considering that Carly was there somehow on the other side of the semicircle from where they were. On another note, it was pretty worrying that it seemed like the show was trying to set up John as the main baddie, and Sam would have to team up with Carly to defeat him. Thank fuck that didn't happen. 
Next up, clearly the writers wanted to have a fight scene with Sam and Bucky, but they didn't know how to get to that point. So Walker starts episode 5 by running away from the plaza. They all end up in another warehouse of some sort. I feel like he would go back to Lamar's body while he waits for his reinforcements to arrive. It's not particularly clear why he does this, as that's just how the episode opens. There's a flash that shows him killing the terrorist, which makes it seem like it was the writer's way of John believing that he's failed as Captain America. America when he really didn't. But given that this was the only Flash and the rest of it was about Lamar, I just think it was meant for them to remind us that this is what John did in the last episode, which yeah, we know. But in reality, Lamar is what John would think about in this situation. I really like the music and why it's acting in the scene, all stressed out, but there's just something that nags me at the moment. The big one is that they keep cutting back to show the blood on that shield. The one shot was fine. Stop showing it again and again. My other issue with the moment is that even though I like the music here, it's drowning out some of the things John is muttering to himself about Lamar. Three of those lines are clear, but just to say them if you didn't hear them. You told me. You didn't want me to go in. Why didn't I listen? Why? I think we were missing something here because we never see Lamar say that they shouldn't go in on the Flag Smashers. He usually mentioned things like keeping a leveled head and having some sort of plan before trying to waltz in like a fucking idiot, ignoring the lack of backup from the government. You know what I mean. But maybe John was referring to that moment. It's hard to tell when the writing makes you fill in the gaps. We get to what I think is the best shot in the show, with Walker on his knees, head on the shield, clearly in a lot of pain, as the music starts to swell and the callback to episode two. Time you gonna work. Love it. I'm glad I got some positives to say before Dumb and Dumber arrived. My best guess is that they were trailing Walker as they arrived at the warehouse on the opposite side. I suppose that part is alright. The image they see is Walker in his most vulnerable state. You would think at this site, everything should be clear to them. The man lost his best friend. Given how broken John looks at the moment, they could assume he might feel bad about killing the terrorist the way that he did. This part is a bit of a stretch, of course, but the Lamar point is what they should really connect with. Let him know that they understand his pain, that they will be there to help John go through this difficult time. This situation with the terrorist doesn't have to all fall on John, even though he did nothing wrong. Because that's what heroes do. Sorry, Thor. It seems like Sam and Bucky didn't get the memo. It's just funny to me that it wasn't them that really started the de-escalation. In fact, Walker is the one that pointed something out to them. You guys should see a medic. You don't look so good. Wow. He seems pretty chill at this moment, even showing concerns for the two Avengers and their health. I still would have liked to see these heroes try to console Walker and his loss, but let's see what they decided to do. Stop, Walker. Um... Why are you treating Walker killing differently from Zemo? Fine, but if you try that shit again- Wouldn't dream of it. Now I had Carly and you overstepped. He's actually proven himself useful today. As Walker has to point out, these two were there. They know what happened. The fact that John isn't erratic like how Sam and Bucky are treating him in the scene after his best buddy died never gets brought up. In fact, Lamar isn't even brought up by them. When John is the one that has to bring this up, we're way past the sub-level in terms of morality, which is still dropping exponentially as we speak. John does give a good helping of humble pie to each of them. He didn't kill Lamar, John. Don't go down that road. Believe me, it doesn't end well. I'm not like you. Whoa! That's right, old man. Fuck you. You don't get to pull the experience card on John, you son of a bitch. Bucky's logic is reaching in terms of Crisis Batman level of cringe. On the one hand, we have a mature, deep, psychological look at what would happen if Batman took a darker path. The other one is a complete cartoon, devoid of depth and devoid of anything resembling Batman. So, which one do you think is which? Paragon of courage. <laughs> I've lost track of how many people I've killed. The Bruce I knew had a code. You start with a code. You hang on to it with every self-righteous breath. But then you take one life. Then another. Then another. 
and another? You'll see. Think about it. A world where there's no crime, no victims, no pain, and no choice. Who elected you, anyway? Who elected you? The problem with democracy is, it doesn't keep you very safe. It has other virtues, but you seem to have forgotten them. I didn't forget. I just chose peace and security instead. You grabbed power, and with that power, we've made a world where no eight-year-old boy will ever lose his parents because of some punk with a gun. standard of writing go into the toilet i want to pinpoint exactly when this happened also you want to know something kind of funny so um this fucking cartoonish cartoon that's not actually a cartoon but is written like a fucking cartoon that is to say he lacks dimension depth he might as well be composed on a flat sheet of paper that is what i mean by cartoon Sam tries to offer some decent advice to John on what he should do. Listen, it was the heat of the battle, okay? If you explain what happened, they may consider your record. We don't want anyone else to get hurt. All seems fine and dandy until we get what Sam really wants. John. You gotta give me the shield, man. So that's what this is. Thank you, John. Those fuckers don't care about you or Lamar. They just want that fucking shield back. Just skipping to the next bit of dialogue. You don't want to do this. Yeah, we do. We should be familiar with how much of a hate boner Bucky has for John at this point. Sam trying to use this moment to manipulate John to get the shield back is another thing. Imagine if John did believe that he probably should not have the shield and that he should really take the time to process what happened and what will happen next. The first thing Sam and Bucky will do is leave with the shield and never come back. They don't care about John and Lamar. They just want the shield back. Those selfish fuckers. So we get a fight scene. Again. I so desperately wanted Walker to win this. Unfortunately, that's not the point. I'll talk about key points in this fight rather than breaking it down completely. Something I didn't notice on the first go around is that Bucky grabs John's sidearm at one point. Then John punches Bucky to have the gun fall to the ground. They do focus on the shot for a bit, indicating that maybe the gun will be used later. Obviously not. But I guess this time, they had the gun away from John, even though nothing really is stopping him from picking it up later. Anyways, John throws the shield at Bucky to the point where it knocks him off of his feet. Either John is much stronger than Steve, or Bucky's vibranium arm is weaker than his metal alloy arm from Winter Soldier and Civil War. I offer that suggestion, and we bring up how it got electrocuted and knocks Bucky out of the fight. Rubbish. John has a... Why are you making me do this? Why are you making me do this? Which works in this moment and in a meta sense to the writers themselves. Why are you making him do this? It just seems so backwards morally. Anyways, so Bucky is out for the count. Fucking bitch. All that's left is Falcon. This means he's won, right? John has tested off the charts as a soldier without the serum. And now, he has the serum. It should be over for Sam. This isn't you, John. We could have been a team. The way you and the writers were treating John makes it seem like this is exactly what you believe John is. Once again, John is absolutely correct. If you and Bucky were a part of his team, John and Lamar wouldn't have to go on their own, then Lamar wouldn't have to have been in the situation where he would die, so John didn't have to be in this position now. Just something to think about. We talked about the I am Captain America and how he ripped Sam's wings. Bucky was shown to be unconscious again. But when John lifts that shield over his head to kill Sam, that's when Bucky is all right. Most in the nick of time, huh? 
Before we continue on with the fight, I know this part will need addressing too, and yeah, I just want to be fair here. Walker attempting to kill Sam and Bucky in the similar manner as Jake is bad and should not be ignored. Granted, Bucky threw a missed punch at John that was able to tear a metal beam, but I could see that being too nitpicky for some. Also, the heroes, Sam and Bucky, were the ones that coerced John into the fight in the first place. You don't want to do this. Yeah, we do. John, for the most part, is on the defensive side of the fight, as he didn't want to be a part of it, mind you. Why are you making me do this? Why are you making me do this? But this part here, where he gets the upper hand on Sam after ripping out his wings and lifting the shield over his head, can contribute from being high of adrenaline in the moment. But considering that Jake's death has additional context for his kill, the same can't be said if he does kill Sam here. Frankly, it's another one of those forced Walker cringe moments that takes a hit towards his character, as I don't actually believe he would do this with Sam. And no, let's not bring up the serum messing with his mind, as we see points before and afterwards that John can still be the same character as he was written before having the serum in the first place. This moment with Sam is where it becomes unbelievable. He's lucky that Bucky decided to respawn in time, a la Anakin in Attack of the Clones, all I'm saying. More fighting happens until we get to the point where Sam and Bucky broke John's arm. We can't just run up on a man, beat him up, and take it. Evidently not. Breaking his arm and knocking him out is alright though. Fucking hell. After all this bitching and moaning and beating up a government agent, Sam and Bucky now have the shield. I think we've thoroughly discussed how utterly broken Sam and Bucky are, but that's for the next video. This is a good segue into the next Walker scene. I'm skipping over the moments where Torres explains the GRC has taken immediate jurisdiction in Latvia, which would have been the thing that would have happened if Walker just told them where the Flag Smashers were, because I think this point is clear at this point of the breakdown. I do plan to talk more about it in the Sam video, particularly about the shield, which leads us to the kangaroo court scene. If you don't know what that is, it's when there is a failure by a court or a tribunal to follow the rules of law, including procedural fairness and natural justice, and just render a verdict based on its emotions or for an ancillary purpose. Basically, what it is, is a court that isn't a real court. It's just like a rubber stamping exercise. So, for example, a lot of totalitarian regimes will say they've got a court, but it's all behind closed doors. You don't get a chance to speak. The decision's made before you even get up there and the penalties grievous and serious. And that's how we get the term kangaroo courts. They're actually horrible things, um, despite the catchy Australian name. Sound familiar? John F. Walker, it is the order of this council that you are no longer to act in any capacity as a representative of the United States government or its military. You were hereby stripped of your title and authority as Captain America, effective immediately. <clears throat> With all due respect, Senator, I don't think you understand the gravity of the situation fully, thereby have misunderstood the circumstances. This is not a negotiation. I understand This that. is a I'm mandate. I'm just asking to be heard. It is a mandate. You will be given an other than honorable discharge, retroactive to the beginning of the month. You will hold no rank in retirement and receive no benefits. At this point, What's the point of even having a trial set up if you're unwilling to hear the context as to what happened? We're talking about stripping all of the achievements and records having to do with John as Captain America, as well as his service as a soldier for the country. It's only because of your previous exemplary service to this country that I'm recommending against a court-martial. And if you continue to demean and denigrate the priorities and dignity of this council, you will spend the rest of your life in the U.S. disciplinary barracks. Consider yourself extremely fortunate, Mr. Walker, and return the shield to us with expedience. They don't even know where the fucking shield is. I'm sorry, but what the fuck? There's no fucking way that the government should be as out of context as the civilians that were in the moment. I mean, just look at John's appearance. The man didn't have a broken arm in the phone scene. Don't you guys think that there was a story worth figuring out? As for the shield, where the fuck do these guys think the shield is? We'll talk about that scene with Sam and Torres in the Sam video. But the GRC are all present in this scene from the outside of the building. Sam walks out of the building with the shield. All John has to say is that he was attacked by Sam and Bucky. They broke his arm, they beat him to a pulp, they stole the shield, and they left him for dead. Permission to present to the council testimony as to the circumstances of the incident. 
circumstances of the incident have been considered. Clearly you don't have all the context, otherwise John wouldn't be as much trouble as he is at the moment. Get a search warrant. Doesn't change the fact that John doesn't have the shield. What would be the reaction if he said that the Dora Milaje were there and how they also beat him and Lamar up? Would they even care? They would never give them consequences for their actions though. And one last part to mention about this abysmal scene is this. I live my life by your mandates. I dedicated my life to your mandates. I only ever did what you asked of me, what you told me to be and trained me to do, and I did it. And I did it well. You built me. I'm not sure what these lines are trying to suggest. Maybe it's meant to indicate some sort of mistreatment of veterans by the government or something? If it was, it sure was way too late to introduce this idea in episode fucking 5. I'm going to skip over the part with Valentina given that she's not a character at this point. She seems to know everything about everyone, even things that you would think that nobody would know about these things. In the comics, she is a triple agent, a lover to Nick Fury, and is one of the Madame Hydras, not the one from Agents of Shield. She also has a mix of Valerie Cooper, a government advisor and liaison that specializes in the regulations of superhuman activities in the US, someone who recruits and works with John Walker. Maybe these elements might give an idea of who she might be and what she could be like moving forward. She knows that Walker doesn't have the shield and that he took the serum. She talks about how many people are interested in people with superhuman abilities, which we'll just have to take her word on that. Two things to highlight from this moment. I would have killed the bastard too. Nobody in there is mad at you about that. I mean, you would have been doing him a favor if you'd taken out the whole lot. But these guys in ties, you know, they got a whole thing to protect. By the way, don't worry about the shield. I know you don't have it. Here's a little dirty state secret. It doesn't really belong to the government. It's kind of a legal gray area. The first part falls under the lack of development to really understand why is it that the government is acting this way outside of the plot making them do this. As for the second part, it was Sam's choice to give the shield to the government in episode 1, and I feel like this legal gray area is meant to throw away what will happen to the shield in episode 6, but that's for a different video. Walker is pretty speechless in the scene, and I can't really blame him. This isn't the last time he's placed in an awkward situation in the episode as he goes to Lamar's place. Outside of two points where they mention the guy John killed. Um, that guy. He's the one that killed our boy? After everything you boys have been through together, I know he's resting easier knowing that the man who's responsible got his justice. It's a pretty generic way to show that John needs to kill Carly, but it's okay fundamentally. As for him lying to Lamar's parents about the true killer, they're already stressed out with the death of their son. No need to add an extra layer with revealing that Carly is the killer. Last thing I want to mention is that it was nice to learn a little bit more about Lamar through his mother. He was so proud of you when they made you Captain America. And he would tell me every day what a honor it was to be your partner. It meant the world to him. It for me too. I just wish there was more about him, or if the show actually cared about his character to begin with. The last thing that happened in the episode is John building his own shield. Nothing to really say about this moment. He puts his medals of honor on the back of the shield, which might be a reference to how John keeps a photo of his late parents tapped to the back of his shield in the comics. The medals don't seem to be much as they mainly use it as a second act low point in episode 6 when all the Flag Smashers kept punching the shield rather than actually punching the actual person. I've mentioned a considerable amount of John content from episode 6 in the Bucky and Flag Smasher videos, so I will skip around the parts that I've already mentioned. It's pretty lucky that John showed up at the time when Bucky was occupied with the burning truck so that he could fight the Flag Smashers. With the show having teleportation like Sharon going from Madripoor to New York in minutes, I'll take this over that. Plus, Morgan Thaw! Let's finish this. Badass. We've talked about Carly saying Lamar's life didn't matter. 
how John is still not mopping the floor with these flag smashers, the best scene in the entire show with John trying to save the falling truck, and how Bucky and John were able to arrest the remaining flag smashers because of Deus Ex Android app. One thing I didn't mention was how after the flag smashers scattered away, and Sam's infrared goggles picking up the track splitting in two directions, John immediately goes down a path that Sam points at. This gives Sam and Bucky a moment to pause in concern at this action. John literally gave up the opportunity to kill Carly and try to save many innocent lives in that falling truck. But we gotta keep an eye on the guy who's trying to save more lives. Because logic. Why don't we add some actual logic? Like, which person is the one that would actually need backup to a threat with the super soldier serum? Probably the one with no serum, even with the vibranium suit. Luckily, he has the normal woman with a gun in the room he was unaware of. Sounds like a wonderful friend to have in both ways. But with all of that, there's just one more thing to mention in this section before we get to the plot wrap-ups. I've been avoiding the speech for some time, and we will go over it extensively in the next video. There's a part of the speech that alludes to John. Yet I'm still here. No super serum, no blonde hair or blue eyes. But because this also involves Steve, I think it's best that we save this for the next video. But keep this in mind. What I will mention is how selfless Walker was in this moment during the shit speech. He doesn't need to go in and take the credit. He doesn't need to give a speech on his own. He did something right, and he's allowing Sam to have his moment, which is bogus, but still pretty humble of him. Sam never acknowledges what Walker did either, selfish cunt. I really can't believe John Walker was ready to kill Sam and Bucky last episode and in the finale he gets a shitty out of nowhere redemption arc. But Carly, whose cause was good, but she was too young and naive to realize her path was wrong, had to die. Who was the one that initiated the fight in the last episode in the first place? Alright, Sam and Bucky. You are correct that the redemption arc came out of nowhere because the previous episode had to use camera angles and evil music to indicate that John needed one in the first place. Not to mention how he was working to save lives and we talked about how Carly and her cause not being coherent in terms of how good or bad it is. But if killing people for this cause is to be classified as young and naive, well then, it seems like we have a discussion about general moralities in order here. Does she have to die in the plot? Not necessarily. But good luck justifying a character that seems too far gone, even to someone like Zemo. With the super soldier serum being able to run around and do what she wants based on the encouragement of her followers around the world. He's not brilliantly written in the finale. He just flipped a switch for no reason to altruism for one second, and for some reason, everyone forgot how awful he is. Also, they're not terrorists. Did you even watch the show? And decent? There was no decent. From the get-go, John was a self-righteous prick who loved to stroke his own ego. Wow, so I agree with the first part. He isn't brilliantly written. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Throughout the video, we've talked about a lot of the good that comes from the John sections of the show is surrounded by loads of contrivances and shit writing around it to structure how they wanted the arc to go. You can say that the Flag Smashers aren't terrorists all you want. Doesn't mean it's not true. Burning a supply facility of innocent people just because they held on to supplies and trying to kill a bunch of council people by driving the truck off the ledge and burning a truck for the sole purpose of distracting Bucky's hero instincts are sending me mixed vibes of what you want to say. But more of that will be discussed in the Sam video. Also, from the get-go, John isn't sure if he deserves the mantle of Captain America, even with all the accomplishments he's had before. But after how he acts in the show, after all the adversity he had to go through with people moving the goalpost, after his choice to save innocent people and not having to gloat about him doing what he did, all of this really shows why John deserves the mantle and the shield over Sam in terms of the show. But again, that's for another video. The last part of John's arc in the show is with him, his wife, and Contessa. Again, a lot of this is difficult to decipher given that Contessa isn't a character at the moment until they do more with her. Something weird she mentioned in the conversation is how she refers to Zemo as a friend of theirs. Looks like our friend Zemo kind of got the last laugh, right? Wow. Couldn't have worked better if I planned it myself. Oh, well, maybe I did. No, I'm kidding, I didn't. Or did I? Given the show, 
I'm not sure how and why John would consider Zemo as a friend. She's also talking about Zemo, how he killed the terrorist with the exploding truck trick, and how this is beneficial for not needing to do any paperwork about the remaining super soldiers being killed in a courtroom at the capital of the United States. Which is another question I have. Why is this taking place at the capital? With Walker getting to put on his new US agent suit, which looks really nice, talking about the things mentioned before, etc. I guess they like this set, even though they use it again in the mid credit scene. Not much else to say about this except for the confirmation of the Thunderbolts movie in the works. Zemo and Walker are said to be involved in the movie, so we'll have to wait and see what that's like moving forward. Basically, it's a team of reformed villains in the comics, but I really don't see how this Walker would be involved with that premise. For starters, Gabriella is uncomfortable with Contessa and her viewpoints on Zemo and the bombing of the Flag Smashers as well as referring to Zemo as a friend of theirs. Not to mention, her lineup of who's going to be on the Thunderbolts team doesn't make any sense either. Considering the likes of Yelena, who learned Contessa betrayed her in Hawkeye, but I suppose she could be around to betray Contessa. But considering Contessa has already been shown to know anything, even when she gets crossed, probably not a smart plan. Red Guard I guess is only there because of Yelena. Ghost? She already has help from Ant-Man and crew with her condition, so I'm not sure what Contessa could really offer her on a Black Ops team. Trash Mistress? I don't really care if her being on the team makes sense or not. And Bucky Barnes? for some fucking reason. Do you honestly believe that they're bonding over the arrest of the remaining Flag Smashers and John's corny Lincoln quote is enough to call themselves friends now, after all that yapping throughout their show? Also, what a pathetic lineup with regards to a majority of them being super soldiers, a black widow, and someone with actual powers like Ghost. John is on a losing team, and with the rumors that they're fighting Sentry? This is where you're gonna die. But we'll have to wait and see. Although, given that the writer of Black Widow is writing this film, it's probably time to say goodbye to one of the best new characters in Phase 4. It was fun while it lasted. John and Lamar had quite the roller coaster, like White's inconsistent beard throughout. Seriously, it got a bit distracting how quickly it grows between scenes. With this thorough breakdown of the two buddies, the conclusions we made about both characters, the good and the bad, which mainly came around the moments due to bad and contrived writing. Let's see what the showrunners wanted us to feel about these characters. He feeds directly into the conversation about what the shield means today. And he embodies, you know, a genuine desire to be good and to do good, but that's not enough to be Cap. What does that even mean? How do you quantify how much goodness someone can have to be Cap? If Sam in the show is your definition of who Captain America should be, then maybe the definition of a good person has changed and I just didn't hear about it. But that's for a different video. And they both explored the conundrum of being a soldier and how difficult it is to walk the lines of following orders as well as doing the right thing. Really, all you have in terms of struggling to follow orders is when Walker decides to not tell the GRC about going to Latvia, which was a dumb idea to do, and you guys showed exactly the reasons why that was a dumb idea later in the show, when you showed what the GRC would have done if John made that decision earlier. Other than that, John and Lamar don't really experience this part of the story. You don't get to eat that cake. The parts I do like come from White and Clay Bennett, no surprise. Especially Clay's enthusiasm about getting the role. I had no idea the character I was playing. I was just excited just to be a part of this Marvel thing. So I had no idea that I was actually going to be an integral character at all. They're like, well, actually, you're, you're Lamar Hoskins. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shoot. And I know Lamar Hoskins because I, I literally have the comic books. I have them. I have the, the, the editions that he's in. You know, that, that famous one where he's the Captain America one, and he, him and they're on, the, they're on the cover, I have that, right? So I was just totally psyched. I was like, I just hope I get, I hope I get a suit, man. I hope they make me a suit. Shame the show didn't respect your character the same way. They couldn't even give his character a character poster. Don't you fucking say it's because he's a recurring character. After all, they can give one to an animated clock, or a bunch of one-off Loki variants, or the fucking broccoli guy from Quantumania. But Battlestar couldn't get one? Fuck off. Listen here. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Stop being a little baby and let the team down. As for the rest of you, head to the mess hall. Dinner is served. White summarizes the situation pretty well with what happened with the S.H.I.E.L.D. incident. I gravitate towards characters who 
need to make difficult decisions and they have to be one thing while trying simultaneously to toe the line of the other. You already have three medals of honor. You consistently make the right decisions in the heat of battle. Yep. Three badges of excellence to make sure I never forget the worst day of my life. Problem is, is that this comes out of nowhere with the given plot, and they don't really have the time to explore this sort of idea. I did have a suggestion of how this part could have been handled better with regards to John and how the world would react in the situation that he was placed in episode 5. It's already pretty odd how he goes to a trial where there was no prior discussion about this trial and getting the context for what happened in Latvia beforehand. I believe the best way to handle this is to keep the conversation in a more secure place with limited people and not at the capital of the United States. That way, John can talk about what really happened. There's no reason for the government officials to just jump the gun when they had no context of the situation. This part is clear given that they really did not know what happened to the shield. John could provide all the context necessary, which might or might not be enough for them to understand the situation. John does have enough of a case given that this was a combat situation, and he has the self-defense card as well. I'm sure the government would make John give a press conference, or John would suggest one for himself, that he should have a conference given that it might be optically strange for Captain America to be in the situation, so he can explain the context for the people to understand, ending with something about not expecting everyone to forgive him immediately, but he hopes that this makes things clear moving forward. I think this will help to get some people to be on his side, while removing the understandable room for those that are still in doubt about John. Then the truck save attempt in episode 6 can be the final act of having the people see that this is who John really is. I think it will make that moment stronger, and it's a pretty simple fix to make. What do we really need to keep in episode 5? Fixing a boat? Just something to think about. You wanna get out of here? Let me know what you guys thought about John and Lamar in the show. Thank you to everyone that's been waiting for this part of the To Fat With series. Just one more part until I put this whole shit to bed. I can't really make any promises of when the next part will drop. All I can really say is to keep your enthusiasm as the video will arrive at some point. And luckily, as Captain America 4 has been delayed for an extra year, that probably gives me some extra time to get the Sam video out. So be on the lookout for that. I got a lot of thanks to give for this one. Pakitar has a part 1 video for praising Spider-Man Homecoming and he's working on the second part. Ultraversal is continuing his fan edit of the MCU and the Phantom Menace. Unity Review and Analysis is currently on a break, but he does have four parts of his Hawkeye critique series at the moment. The two of us have a podcast together called Another Reviews Core, where we talk about movies and TV shows each week. I would also like to thank Sty Games, Noob Sunrider, High Ground User, Mr. Miyagi, and Operation Bagel as well. Here are a bunch of random clips for that part of the video. Know his way around a blade. I can just imagine some executive thought. Cats. They're adorable. But you know what they're missing? Boobs. Yeah, you know, Who's your mommy? I wonder why he has us down here so long. I don't know. If we had been doing these exercises all along, we'd be in good shape. <laughs> I don't see how you can exercise anyway in that dress. It's so tight. I'm surprised it doesn't cut off your circulation. Honey, in Hollywood, the tighter the dress, the more the girls circulate. We can navigate the stars, bring up I spent tons of time letting you boss me around, and now it's your turn. So lesson number one, while I'm casually talking to you, find some small excuse to touch me. Great job. These are my minions. I don't know their names. I don't want to know their names. They are known as... Chanel number two. Chanel number three. Chanel number five. I'm Chanel number one, obvi. Um, if you were ever wondering what it was like to be famous, this is it. Um, very glamorous and sexy and everybody wants to sleep with you and kiss you all the time and people give you lots of free food and free clothes and alcohol and basically I just never pay for a thing myself. <laughs> Be sure to subscribe to my friends with the links in the description down below. If you like reviews and opinions on movies, comics, TV shows, and video games, you can subscribe to my channel, Red Devilos Reviews, for more of that content. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon. Peace.